Let's get started. Uh, happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to Chapman University. I'm the Dean of the Argus School of uh, Business and Economics here at Chapman University. I've been on the job only a couple of months. I came uh, back to California uh, in uh, August to uh, help lead the school to uh, new heights. And super excited to be here today with you and have such a fantastic panel of speakers to talk about uh, the topic of the future of cities. So uh, the United States, the Western part of the United States have traditionally taken an important role in shaping how cities in the U.S. more generally are developing and holding and so on. And now we see some challenges to that. We have uh, significant homelessness. Uh, we have uh, significant uh, increases in home prices, a lot of challenges, and how do we address those challenges and how do we move forward? That's what our panelists will uh, talk about today. And I'm very happy to uh, say that the, uh, the, the first person I will introduce here is uh, my good friend, uh, Joel Kotkin, who is uh, one of our presidential fellows. He also holds the uh, Roger Hobbs uh, uh, Fellowship, Professorship, I in uh, urban studies here at Chapman University and uh, had the chance to interact with Joel many times during his visit here. Uh, and he's provided a lot of thought leadership for us. So it's good to have you here, Joel. Um, Ryan uh, Streeter is uh, over here and he's the State Farm James Q. Wilson Scholar and also the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, it's so great to have you here. Wonderful uh, introduction uh, meeting we had earlier today, and we are so uh, so happy about the sponsorship that AEI also is providing uh, for the conference. So it's great to have you here. Um, we have uh, Natalie uh, Gopnor, who is here, who is coming uh, in from uh, Utah. She's the associate dean at the David Eccles uh, School of Business and also the director of the Chem C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah. So I'm so pleased to have you here as well uh, as a uh, uh, as a uh, uh, associate dean, uh, as a director. It's great to have you here and listen to your perspective. We have uh, Carla Lopez de la uh, welcome to you as well, uh, who is uh, a community development executive uh, and also a principal at Connections Consulting. So it's great to have your perspective here today as well. Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, we have also our friend uh, Charles Blaine here, who is the president of uh, Urban Reform and the Urban Reform Institute coming here from Texas, and that will provide uh, another perspective as well for us. So um, with those introductory remarks, let me hand it over to our guest here. So Joel, you're going to start by giving a few remarks, and then we will open up to all of you guys and ask some questions for the panel. But we will have each of the panelists first talk a little bit to, uh, to you guys. So Joel, you go first. All right. All right. I thanks, Henrik. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here, you know, in this weird era that we're in, getting people to show up live, really to come up with a major challenge. And and I'm, I'm so pleased that you're all here. Um, the book, which um, was uh, put together by AEI, you know, I think really uh, talks about some of the real changes that are going on. Um, some of it driven by the pandemic, but what I'm going to try to talk to you about <clears throat> is that the pandemic only accelerated what was already happening. Um, and, the, and I think it did speed up the technological revolution <laughs> that I think is also shaped city. So, um, so I want to just share a few things here. Um, uh, Ibn Khaldun, if you haven't read him, uh, an Arab historian of the 14th century, um, said a lot of smart things. Um, and actually, uh, if you go into this um, amazing period of uh, Islamic history, um, they, they had these people who traveled all over the world um, and, and wrote up their commentary. So, when I want to find out some things about happening in certain parts of the world in the 14th, 15th century, I know we're probably not interested, but um, the reality is that he had some great um, ideas. And he said, when there is a general change of tradition, it is as if the entire creation had changed and the whole world altered. And I think that's what we're going through. Some of it is long stick, it's technological, it's demographic, and it, it also um, has to do with what, some of the big changes in the world where and we, we deal with this in the book. We have chapters that deal with, with uh, cities in Africa. We have uh, chapters in, in the book about the, uh, the cities in China. So a lot of these things are applicable on a global level. Now, th this is uh, just 
most of the things will be on the US, but you know, one of the things that always drove me a little bit nuts when I, you know, uh, reading the media is they're thinking everybody's moving back to the Pacific, everybody's going to be in these dense cities, the denser the better. And meanwhile, you know, my colleague Wendell Cox and others have been saying, well, how about looking at the census, like looking at the numbers? But as I remember when I was debating somebody on, on CNN about, about the future of cities and the, uh, uh, and, and, and I asked one, I said, well, why do you think people hate suburbs? I said, well, all my friends in Greenwich Village hate suburbs. I said, well, really? <laughs> okay. That's a really good sound. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what we are seeing is that cities are actually becoming less dense almost everywhere in the world. One of the things um, that um, happened in the past, particularly, is that they, uh, business centers were uh, and offices were built in the areas where the um, where the old neighborhoods were. So that, like, if you go to Beijing, for instance, the areas that used to be filled with residential neighborhoods are now office buildings and and have sort of displaced. The same thing's true in Tokyo. So what, what we see is that most cities are much less crowded than they once were. Um, uh, you know, you look at Paris, you look at um, New York, I'm just, you know, New York one time the Lower East Side uh, was the densest place on the planet around 1900. Uh, that's why my grandparents went there. I tell me, it was probably better than Russia. Um, but the reality is what's happening is a universal movement, even when cities in the developing world are growing, they're growing at the outskirts. Um, and I, I think there are lots of reasons for this, but I think this is accelerating. And oddly enough, the one place that's gotten a little denser is the Los Angeles region, but because we started off as much less dense um, and now a much denser. But the reality is the urban density around the world is changing um, and people are spreading out and of course we get reasons. But I just wanna show you some numbers here. This is the, the, the Net domestic migration poor versus suburbs. Um, and what we what you can see is, is there was a brief period um basically around um, 2012 where urban growth and the growth in the suburbs were, was almost even. Um, and then you can see what happened, and you can see what happened in 2020. But the, the long-term trend is pretty clear. Um, that's a lot to do with cost of housing has to do with you know, increasing with the issue of public safety. And um, it has to do with the fact that, that work can be now dispersed much more. Um, I mean, if you think about what's happening um, in, and you know, Charles is our Texas expert, but you know, one of the things that, that that's clear is companies now feel even high-end business service companies say they can locate into North Dallas and serve the whole country. They don't have to be different uh, in, in one or two or three uh, of the major cities. So they're both dispersing in different cities and to the suburbs of those cities. For instance, in Houston, um, I, I probably shouldn't talk about it, but I will. Um, you know, in Houston, you know, Charles and I were talking about the city of Houston, we think of it as a boom town, but it's actually losing population. And even Harris County, which is the county surrounding uh, what they, the, uh, the city of Houston is about stagnant. But there's very rapid growth in the counties around. But increasingly, what people are finding is they're making the choice for many reasons. Um, now, a lot of it's demographics. As people get older, they start families, they want to buy a house, they, they really can't do it in, in, the, in the urban core. So this is this is basically a long grinding trend. So if we take a look, um, another way is if you look at the 52 largest metro areas, you can see that they've lost population. Uh, every year since 2016, uh, in terms of net domestic migration. Now, in the past, and I'll get into this a little bit later, the um, immigrants came and sort of made up for the fact that the local residents were leaving. Um, but now, what we're seeing is the immigrants are figuring out that they want to be the suburbs too. And and what, what you see is like you know one of the things I always get a kick out of is um, and you know call this take to these places there. There were great Mexican restaurants in the Inland Empire. There were the best Vietnamese food in America is in Orange County. Um, and so I think we're seeing a, a huge change in the nature of suburban growth. And again, it's driven by domestic migration, but what we're also seeing is immigrants are choosing 
to go to cities that are generally less dense. Like just what interesting thing, the biggest increases in immigration were in Miami, um, the, uh, the growth of the foreign born population, and um, and with Dallas and Houston, uh, and um, Los Angeles actually lost um, foreign born population in the last decade. Um, so what's happened more recently, and we you know again we can't be totally sure that that is the um, going to be the long-term pattern, but San Jose and San Francisco, and I think in fact, I think Google announced that ten thousand layoffs uh, today. That's probably not going to help the demographics. Um, and what we're seeing is the cities that were most built, particularly San Francisco, New York, which were really built on this idea. Uh, but uh, Gene Gutman wrote about the transactional city where you, the, the future of the city was high end um, business crowded into, into central districts. And many cities have done that. Um, but those that have been most dependent are having the hardest time. Um, San Francisco, in, in particular, um, crime, all the things that Henry was mentioning, crime, uh, homelessness, you know, friends might say, well, don't never take your phone to San Francisco because it's going to get broken into. The cops aren't going to do anything about it. Well, that's not a great recommendation. Los Angeles, um, if you've been to downtown LA, not a pretty picture. Um, and I always wonder, like, if I had a company, would I want my employees to have to be in an environment filled with homeless people? Um, and particularly, I would think for, for the female workers, a particular problem, you know, getting harassed and things like that. So. What we're seeing, generally speaking, is that people are leaving high crime and also um, very much a high density of um, areas. And what, what's happened is that people now are able to work more remotely. So let's say in New York City, where people used to be five days a week going into the pack, um, and you can tell that my hometown, uh, people going into Manhattan, there are, uh, they, uh, maybe they're coming in once. Maybe they're coming in, not at all. So let's say if, if you let's say if your if your job is in down is in downtown LA, and you only have to come in once a week, you're more likely to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to move further out in the Inland Empire, or I'm going to move, you know, to Palm Springs, I'm going to move somewhere I, I want to be, um, and still you know, hold on to my job. So we're really in this, as Ibn Khaldun said, we're really in this major historic change. Um, where it ends up, I, I can't tell you, but but I, I do think that we're going into an era of much greater dispersion of economic and um, demographic pie. Um, and one of the big things that, of course, is that people say, well, young, I remember this from years young people aren't interested in housing. They don't want to have a backyard. Um, you know, that the, the new generation wants to live in a high density, high intense um, environment. Now, that is somewhat true up until the age of 30. And then that changes almost completely. There are some people, you know, not the Woody Allen types who would have to be in, in New York because you know, they, they couldn't survive anywhere else. Um, but the reality is most people, when they take a look at millennials, about 60% want a single family. Well, you try to get a single family home in an urban setting, particularly when you have cities who are essentially saying, you know, if you live in a single family home in a urban area, we're going to densify it and you're not going to be able to have what you want. So we've got some great urban neighborhoods around the country, you know, in Los Angeles and other cities that are under assault by developers and, and planners who are sort of trying to sort of destroy that um, single family neighborhood culture and that accelerates it as well. Um, so this was a what I thought one of the really amazing statistics. And then this is pre-pandemic. And as you can see, Miami, which is the whole Miami Dade area, was the largest place for the increase in the number of foreign born. Um, then Dallas, then Houston, both ahead of New York, which is the traditional center of, of where people go. And now we have um mayor Adam saying that can't take any more. Uh, of, of the undocumented who've been crossing the border. Um, for a mayor of New York to be unable to accommodate the 50,000 people, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Um, anyway, so the bottom line is that foreign born are also dispersed, and they're dispersing predominantly to fairly low density cities. 
Um, and that's been pretty much the, the case um, over the last 10 years. Um, and then the other thing that the suburbs have changed. Um, so the vast majority of all the brokers in the suburbs of the United States in the last um, last 20 years has been among um, Hispanics, um, African Americans, Asians. Four percent of the growth in suburban um, um, life is, um, is is from white families. So you know, I, I, I one day I got a I hate Twitter, but I, I you know some, I wrote an article where I was talking about these things. They said, well, it shows that you know the fact that it's so it's a good show for the racist. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, can I be a racist if I'm talking about places mm -hmm. where minorities are moving? Um, and yet, you know, we unfortunately a lot of um, particularly people in academia and the media don't understand that this is 2023 and not 19. Um, and, and this is a major change um, that's taking place. And but you find increasingly is that the great concentrations of immigrants are now in the suburbs. The most diverse county um, in the United States, Fort Bend County, um, outside of uh, Houston. And it's just an amazing place where basically a quarter African American, a quarter Hispanic, a quarter Asian, a quarter white. It also has an enormous Indian um, a good place for Indian food. Uh, but, but the reality is that this is where America is going. And my point is that just because people live in the suburbs doesn't mean that they don't live in the city, they live in a different kind of city. And what's exciting about it is these cities are beginning to evolve. And if you want to just see a, a really uh, a really good example of where suburbia um, is going. Just walk down to the, to the circle area here in orange, which basically gives you a lot of the good things of the urban experience without a lot of the bad. And I was very happy that my my kids could go to the circle instead of going to the place. And I think what you're seeing is more and more of these suburban communities are building some sort of urban infrastructure. Include, I think there's going to be greater competition from suburbs and smaller cities. Um, some people say that's anti urban. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said the city is where the citizen goes. And I think, you know, people who live in Orange are part of the Los Angeles region. We're just as much a part of it as somebody who lives down. Um, uh, some cities like New York uh, may try to be a luxury city. Um, but it's going to have more and more competition and more and more people moving to other areas. And I've seen like a lot of new cultural institutions growing, for instance, in Westchester County, New York, where a lot of people have moved as they moved out of the city. And if you've been to the Hudson Valley, it's one of the great places in North America. Um, but even New York has got a lot of uh, competition. Some cities like Chicago, I think, more challenging because A, their weather is worse. Um, their crime is worse, and their and their city government is even more. Um, uh, because LA is trying to catch. Up. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think that you know people talk about you know, the suburbs are, are are bad for the environment, but the reality is, if people live live and work either at home or nearby, they're actually using a lot less gas, a lot less power. Um, and they actually would be quite good. And again, many of the really interesting suburban developments I've seen, with Woodlands being a good example outside of Houston, or even we just take a look at Irvine. It's a very environmentally friendly area, you know, kind of place where um, there's a great deal of efficiency. By the way, Irvine has the highest rates of working at home and the shortest commutes of almost any place. And that has to do with the fact that this was very well planned. Um, so, but the, but the poor cities have to be, they have to realize that they've got this real competition and they're going to have to change their approach. I think one of the problems with cities is it's all been about grandiosity and, and, you know, we're the center of the universe. And so everybody has to be there. It's like member Bloomberg saying, well, New York is where you have to be, be successful. And I said, you know, I think there's a bunch of guys outside of San Jose yeah. pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so the reality is that success can be very short and can move from place to place. So we're in an era of intense competition. And the key thing I think the city, and um, I'm, I'm sure Ryan has some comments on this too, is you got to deal with the crime issue. You got to deal with the school issue. 
if you've got to deal with the sanitation issue. And cities want to do everything but that. They want stadia for, for professional sports teams. They, they, they want to build high-rise luxury apartments for people who are there two days a year. Um, but the reality is you've got to get back to the basics. And the key thing is crime and schools and the basic infrastructure. And right now, I don't see a lot of discussion in that direction. Hopefully, our book will nudge people in that direction. So anyway, that's uh, that's to get us started in Brian. Hey, Joel. Um, thanks, Henry, uh, for having us here and for um, hosting us today in this wonderful facility and, and, and bring uh, all these great people together. Uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun to work with Joel and my co authors on this project um, because it gave us an excuse really to bring together people that were looking at urban area issues from a contrarian perspective that we think is the, the, the right perspective in general. And, and I've known Joel for a number of years now. We've collaborated on some projects together. I've learned from, from him over the years. And I think we've found um, that we have in common a real interest in kind of the metropolitan nature of what we often call urban areas. Um, and that, as Joel was just saying, it really is these uh, more far flung areas uh, around what we think of as urban cores, where a lot of the action is, where the population growth is. It's where, as he said, immigrant families are moving. And they've been doing that for, for quite a while. Um, and so I think the, the nature of uh, urban issues when we talk about them, it's uh, a little skewed by those who write about them, by those who cover them, even by those who study them in the university to, to overly focus on kind of core cities when we're talking about urban urban areas, as, as Joel was saying. Um, we talk a lot, and I'm from Washington, D.C. I work in a think tank there. So unfortunately, um, our main audience for our work are policymakers, which means politicians. So we have to deal with political discourse all the time. And, and the people that utter political discourse <laughs> all the time, uh, one of the least fun parts of the job. And I hear regularly, you hear regularly uh, in our uh, political debates about the urban rural divide, um, which is one of the strangest fictions, uh, I think, in terms of describing the country, since the majority of people in this country don't live in an urban or a rural area, they live in a suburban area. And the, the, the Census Bureau doesn't even really have a good definition of the suburbs. Um, we use a lot of outdated categories. And so part of what Joel's done for a number of years, what I've tried to do is actually look at these kind of large agglomerations of people um, that we usually call by the name of the city or refer to someone living in Phoenix, for instance, or Nashville, and they may not actually live in Phoenix or Nashville. They live in the, the area there and try to figure out what's actually really going on um, in, in the economies of those places and the sociocultural context of those places, because that's that's actually, for, for someone who focuses on public policy, that's actually where you should be deriving your policy conclusions from. So instead of trying to come up with a, an interesting um, uh, theory of what makes a city a dynamic place, I prefer the where are people going uh, theory of um, urban development um, or metropolitan policy because you can learn a lot by looking at migration patterns, which Joel's spent a, a good part of his, his career doing. And to set the context for what I wrote about the book and what I heard about um, in a number of other places, uh, I would like to look at the last 40 year trend. In metro areas that I think is one of the most fascinating trends that you probably never heard of or heard very little of. And that is just just in our many of our adult lifetimes from the mid-1980s until now. If you look at the 15 most economically unequal metropolitan areas, not just cities, but the metro areas in the country, just in 1985, the top 15, and that's it, most unequal divided, it is, is basically defined as the gap between the top 10% earners and, and bottom 10% earners for this, for this particular exercise. Um, about eight of those 15, over half of those uh, metro areas are mid sized metros in the South, um, where the, the measure of, of economic inequality in the mid 1980s, when you think about this, 20 years after the Civil Rights Act, is still very much a legacy of racial discrimination and segregation uh, in economic terms. Uh, none of the big fancy metro, San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., were in the top of the um, The only large metro area back then uh, in the top 15 was uh, New Orleans. When you fast forward to today, all of those cities are in the top 15 most unequal uh, metro areas in the country, and almost no cities in the South except for um, New Orleans are still on the list. 
So the, the face of geographic inequality, the nature of it, has shifted in a relatively short period of time in this country so that um, it is these, these places which we actually know are losing people have become, but they're, but they're engines of economic uh, power in our country are the places that are most, the most unequal. And that's happened for you know, some distinct reasons. Um, a couple of twin forces kind of in conflict with each other. Um, people moving to where there's all kinds of opportunity, economic opportunity, professional advancement kind of opportunity in those places. And then the people that um, essentially have the levers of power in those places and are benefiting the most from the prosperity find it within their interest to kind of slow that down. Right. And so we've, we've had this, this um, problem in all of these places where we've had uh, just rising unaffordability. Um, the barriers of entry into these places are, are really difficult. So, what do people do? Uh, they go to where those barriers are lower. And when you look at where they go, that's where you can actually see what the best kind of policy, if you, if you, if you care about public policy, if you're a mayor, a city councilor, or you work in the state government. Um, you would have an interest in taking lessons from that. So what are some of those lessons? Well, we know that over the last 20 years, the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the country are kind of sunbelt um, places, right? We, we've read a lot about that. And why is that? Well, it's because you can afford a home. It's more affordable. Um, it's because in many of these places, the schools function better. Uh, as Joel just mentioned, historically, most of them have um, really relatively sound public safety environments. Um, and the ease of doing business um, by the various measures of, of, of looking at that issue are usually higher in these places. The tax structure is better, it takes less time to get uh, permits, it takes less time to get business registrations. And one thing that I think is really important too is just uh, the newness of the infrastructure and the newness of housing as well. When you just look at the median uh, year of construction for most homes in the Nashvilles and the Austins and the Phoenixes and the Orlandos and the Jacksonvilles of the world, and you compare them to those in Silicon Valley, where I think the median you know, home construction year is something like 1973. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see the people, it's just, it's a bummer, you know, when your when you're sewage pipe is breaking and you have to pay for it. And, and when the shingles are sliding down, down, down your roof, these are very practical things. Um, but when a place has enough mix of jobs in, in important sectors of the economy, and that's another important part of what I call an opportunity metro area, that is if you move somewhere, you know that if you don't stay with the company that you move there for, and that there's another place that you can go, there's a competitive environment that you can build. All of these places that are growing the fastest have that dynamic as well. Um, and so, what I think is really important for policymakers to do is to actually look um, together at which places are growing the most population wise, which ones are seeing the most wage growth and economic growth, and which ones are seeing the, the, the slowest rise um, in the unaffordability of their housing. You can measure that um, using several different types of indices. And, and ways. When you roll all those things together, you see city, you try to look at the cities that are kind of top 10 of all those types of measures. And that's where the Raleigh, North Carolina is popped out. That's where the Austin, Texas is popped out. Until recently, Austin's bumping up against some problems now because it's, it's for the first time ever in the last 20 years starting to have a problem keeping its housing supply up with the, the demand uh, for a number of reasons. So we might start seeing that become a problem for Austin. But when you when I lived in Austin before I moved back to Washington. I was there for a few years, and, and uh, Joel and I did we did a study, and uh, you, sorry, you were involved in that study on Texas urbanism in various different metro areas. And even then, in 2015, you had more 25 to 35 year olds living in the Austin metropolitan statistical area than you did in the San Jose statistical area, which is encompasses a lot of Silicon Valley. And so we interviewed a lot of them, and when you ask them why they moved there, it's all of those those reasons. So the cities that are growing the fastest grow for what I basically call um, kind of metropolitan heartland reasons, um, middle class reasons, uh, bourgeois cultural reasons. Uh, people of all stripes, all demographics, typically move into these metropolitan areas for these reasons and are departing um, the, the big sort of well-known TV set cities um, for those reasons as, as well. And so the, the cities that are now in the current boom in this time of great transformation that Bill talked about, the Nashvilles and the Denvers and others, there's a lot of self-conscious leadership in these places about these various very things that we're talking about. And that's going to make it harder for the San Franciscos and New Yorks and others to um, to recover um, if they can't learn those, those very same lessons. Just a couple other things I'll leave with you, and I can I can address other other issues and questions. Is that um, when you when you, when you look uh, at even a little bit more granularly at some of those sorts of issues, we created what we call an opportunity metro index, about 13 different 
categories of, of data on different ways of measuring um, affordability within an area of housing and cost of living wise, um, various measures of economic growth um, and engagement in the labor force. Um, you, you started to see over the last five years or so through the COVID time, some interesting um, trends. The, the cities that there, there are cities up in the top in the top ten of all those categories that you would expect. Some of the ones I just mentioned, the Sun Belt cities. Um, but you're seeing, you're seeing Atlanta's made a little for instance, um, uh, taking advantage of, a, of, of some of those very dynamics that we're talking about. But you're seeing what I call rust belt cities with uh, some sun belt characteristics like Columbus, Ohio, um, in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, actually on those sorts of measures actually doing quite well. And in this time of great transformation that Joel talked about, there's an opportunity for even those metro areas and states that we sort of wrote off a while ago, the place that we call the rust belt, which is actually where I'm from. Um, so I kind of resent that, but <laughs> but the uh, Sunbelt characteristics in my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana are very, very real. So it, what we're seeing with some of these trends is that uh, it is possible for these places that we wrote off a while ago to learn these lessons and actually scoot back some of that population, some of that growth um, from some of these other places. So this is a kind of an ever un unfolding game. The last thing I'll say, and this is based on, on a bunch of survey research that we do at the American Enterprise Institute, which I think is important if you're into city planning or into the, the dynamic nature of cities and why people move there and what they're looking for. Um, and Joel touched on some of this as well. We found that I, I, I call it the proximity index, basically, that we created. We look at uh, how close people are to the core amenities that kind of make life meaningful. When you're not at work and you're not at home, where are you? Uh, are you at the coffee shop, dog park, your kid's school, what have you? When we look at how far people are from those places, and this is not a walkability measure, this is a time measure, uh, five to 10 minutes by car, by public transport, by foot, by bike, what have you. When people are um, within a five to 10 minute commute of uh, four to six of those kind of core amenities, their satisfaction with the community goes really high. You're going to ask two people in the very same neighborhood uh, how they assess their community, and those that are actually availing themselves of the amenities in and around where they are. Um, uh, rate their neighborhoods higher, they're more likely to say yes when asked to volunteer. Um, they uh, generally, we have different measures of informal social capital, how many people do you talk to every week, how well do you know your neighbors. Um, uh, when people are out and about in their communities, it actually has a lot of great spillover effects. So when people are engaged in their communities, those places are typically more productive, um, there's a better civic culture. And so uh, when we're talking about making places affordable, uh, I think we need to be looking at more than just the housing. Uh, that's first and foremost. We need to make sure that people have communities that are really great to, to live in. And these can be low density suburban communities. I happen to live my entire adult life in cities, and I, I love cities and raised to adult kids in cities. We've never had that backyard or garage, but, but most people don't want that. And you can actually have um, a lot of proximity uh, in, uh, in a suburban context. So I think that's a really important lesson as we're trying to think about what makes a place a kind of opportunity metro. We also need to take into account these sorts of things that make communities um, worth living. So I'll be happy to talk about some of that uh, further uh, with, with question and answers. I'll turn over to Natalie. Natalie. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Joe. A pleasure mm -hmm. to join you today. My name is Natalie Doctor. I uh, lead what's called the MC Gardner Policy Institute uh, at the University of Utah. And I was invited to share a little case study on future cities uh, from the vantage point of Salt Lake City in the state of Utah. I'm going to set this up by just telling you a little story. I was driving home from work March 11th, 2020. Just that date should start to <laughs> mean something to you. I tuned in to hear the Utah Jazz. They were playing the Oklahoma City Thunder. So I was just listening to radio on the way home. Just kind of see what's happening with my team. I'm a fan. Uh, something was awry. Uh, the announcers didn't know what to do. You know, there's the game didn't start, there's delay, they don't have content, a lot of confusion. After about 30 minutes, uh, the game was canceled, and the All Star Center of the Utah Jazz, Rudy Gobert, had tested positive for COVID 19. That was the same day that the NBA suspended for the season and the World Health Organization declared COVID 19 a pandemic. And the world, as we know, has changed. So here's the thing. Within 13 days of March 11th, the state of Utah and its capital city, Salt Lake City, became the first state in the nation to have a published COVID-19 economic plan available to everyone in the state. 13 days. Uh, it came from our governor. It was called Utah Leads Together. 
it went through five additional updates because uh, I mean, nobody knew how to do this. Uh, but it was the guidance document for Salt Lake City and the state of Utah's response. And I share it with you as an instructive example of a state that really knows how to come together, to collaborate, to invest in community, uh, to cross party lines, to solve intractable problems. The result looks something like this. Uh, the cumulative case fatality rate for COVID deaths per 100,000 people uh, third lowest in the state of Utah. So on a macro health measure, does pretty well. Well, if you look at the economic measure, so the number of jobs in the economy before COVID and the number of jobs today, uh, second highest job growth in the country. So on both the health measure and the economic measure, uh, Utah uh, home party. Megan McCardle is a journalist with the Washington Post, and she wants to find in will appreciate this. He, she said, Utah is a bit like Sweden, might be if it were run by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> but think about that for a minute. Very data-oriented, pragmatic business approach, but the um, solidarity, the collaboration that comes uh, when you think about public interest. Utah and Salt Lake City are highly collaborative places, also very focused on outcomes, uh, importantly, a place where the focus isn't bigger government, but better people. And I'm pulling that quote from our governor, Spencer Cox, who in his 2021 <clears throat> state, of the, state of the State Address said this, it's not governments that makes this country special. It's volunteer organizations, and churches, philanthropists, and neighbors taking care of each other and solving problems so government doesn't have to. In short, if we want smaller government, so Utah leaders from both sides of the aisle have popularized, popularized approach known as the Utah way. And honestly, it's used all the time in my home state. I was driving to work this week at the first day of our legislative session. They have the House Minority Leader on the radio during drive time, a woman named Romero, and she was talking about the Utah way. She's a Democrat, it's a state nominated by Republicans. We all talk about the Utah way. What is it? Collaborative spirit data-driven policies, good faith compromise, consensus building, civil discourse. Governor um, Cox uh, said this, he said, when he defined United Air, uh, Utah Way, he said, it's a mindset to think creatively about solutions to community problems and invite a wide range of parties to come to the table. It involves intense collaboration, real selflessness, and a desire to find actual solutions as opposed to cheap political victories. So policy solutions in Salt Lake City and Utah begin with an understanding of the proper role of government and more importantly, the proper role of people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just briefly share three examples of, of how Salt Lake City and Utah has approached uh, some problems facing American cities, uh, poverty, homelessness, and healthcare. Uh, the first is intergenerational poverty. So in Utah, we are one of just a handful of red states that do it this way, but we take poverty on a public policy level and divide it into situational and intergenerational. So think of situational as a divorce, a major health event, a death, a lay, you know, layoff, a loss of job, That's something that you can address and get out of. Uh, intergenerational, we measure it as adults who participate in 12 cum uh, cumulative months of public assistance as a child and 12 cumulative months of public assistance as an adult <laughs> plus their children. And the reason this is, requires high collaboration and the like is you have to pull together all the administrative data sets to be able to define that cohort and track them over time. And we have done that in our state. Uh, we do systematic tracking of intergenerational poverty, uh, and we've taken action. The actions that we take, uh, because the data leads us there, is to focus on the child, not the parent, in intergenerational cases. Whereas in situational, you want to focus on the adults. Uh, we just started, we started doing a quality rating system of uh, daycare centers. We increased school-based behavioral health practices, providing services right on site in the schools. 
result has been that since 2012, Utah has moved from 11 on the Danny E. Casey Foundation's overall child well-being, 11th to 4th. So a really notable change for a reputable rating source. Our high school graduation rates of intergenerational poverty children have increased from 50% in 2012 to 79% today. That is solving the problem. Because if you don't graduate from high school, you're arguably on the sure path to poverty. Okay, homeless services, doing these really quickly. Uh, I'm going to approach this with a lot of humility. I don't think any American city has figured out how to approach homelessness. But in April of 2021, our mayor, Karen Mendenhall, announced the formation of a partnership to create a tiny home village uh, to serve Utah's homeless population. It's known in our state as the Other Side Village. It's still in the permitting process, uh, but it's it's got some real traction. Uh, the innovation in this case is based on the premise that building community is the ultimate solution to homelessness. So you know the housing first approach: build housing, have homes, have you know housing. Uh, this uh, approach recognizes that that at the heart of homelessness is a catastrophic loss of community. And that by creating a peer based community where people heal and thrive through community and connection, we can do something great. Um, we have a, a philanthropist and thought leader in our state named Joseph Granny who sums it up like this. He says, quote, community is the key to healing. No matter how broken you are, the key is always community, it's always connection. So, this uh, proposal is led by guiding beliefs of universal worth of all human beings, accountability, self reliance, personal faith. Um, one of our uh, journalists who has a public policy uh, program on a drive time a radio station said, This is Utah and Salt Lake City at its finest. This is not about handouts, this is about accountability, about a set of principles, and giving people a chance to really move up. Self-reliant value to our Happy to answer more questions about that. Last one is health policy. In this case, I chose to focus on the Utah Alliance uh, for the Determinants of Health. It's a three-year pilot project formed by Intermountain Healthcare, which is the largest hospital system in our state. They went to two cities in our state that had a lot of health disparities and focused on the upstream drivers of improved health. Uh, things like affordable housing, food insecurity, transportation issues. These are all non-medical factors that improve health. The leader in Mount Healthcare, Dr. Mark Harrison said, quote, many people will say your zip code plays more of a role in your health and healthcare than any other factor. When we look at the factors that influence a person's health, we think it's about 20% medical care, 20% genetics, and 60% social factors. That's coming from our in the lead position of our largest health system. So they got these, they went to these two communities, did wraparound services, collected a lot of data, completed over 20,000 social need health screenings, and were able to improve screening rates uh, by 40 to 45% in emergency departments, and uh, the use of emergency departments declined by 25 to 45% over the course of my favorite finding is the value of seemingly small things. There's this adage that big things often have small beginnings. One lesson from the Alliance is that it's sometimes a phone charger or a taxi ride that can turn the tide of someone's life. The community health workers are given discretionary funds uh, to intervene when there are challenges. A lap, they bought a laptop for a critically ill um, mother, so her sorry, a critically a mother of a critically ill child, so the mother could be successful in school. Uh, a winter coat for an infant, a swamp cooler pump, uh, bus tokens, personal hygiene supplies. Uh, once again, we learned that it's people and the needs of people, not government, that should be the focus. So, just to close, I'll say that um, as I was writing this, The Economist magazine. Had a cover story on the triumph of big government. I don't know if any of you remember it, but they talked about a supersized state and they called it the great embiggening. They suggested that this march towards bigger government is actually almost inevitable because of an aging population and uh, the warming of our planet. In Utah and Salt Lake City, we find it's not bigger government that matters, but better government that, that bigger people. If policymakers continue to debate government's role, they will do well to consider 
better government, not the size of government, but better government in the form of innovative ideas, data driven research, and effective collaboration. If cities and states pull away from polarized extremes, inspire individual action, and pioneer a grand of constructive policy making, they'll make positive results. Such an approach places people at the center of improving outcomes in poverty, homelessness, and health. Let's imagine a better world and fight for it. Thank you so much. Your patience and getting the text set up. Um, I just love uh, your approach. I just wanted to thank you about it. And um, on my day job, I actually work for the Trump University. So I, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying. It's difficult to hear that in the in the academia experience where I work uh, in government and uh, this approach continues to grow. And it's so important to hear that because uh, it's been such an so I want to bring you here now, um, your neighbor now. I used to live in Orange County, but I have moved to Riverside County. It was a county that gave me the opportunity to buy a house. I was a single mom that was on public assistance when I went back to college. I decided that I wanted to do something different. And when I graduated from college, I ended up coming back to my mom's house. She lived in Chino, which is um, um, uh, not, too far, not too far from here. If there's no traffic, you can probably get there in a bus or time. Um, as I grew older, I never thought I would leave uh, Orange County, but not reality, but it was also my reality. I could not afford to stay here. And although I worked for a nonprofit that helped low and moderate income families that came from ownership here in Orange County, I couldn't apply to my own federal job uh, quite. So I, I was not allowed to, to use those funds. But um, I found the opportunity to say, and it's in the world that I have discovered, I want to share it with you. Now that I'm part of your so uh, the first thing I wanted to show you was this thing I found in Reddit, and then I wanted to find out like where else do you find this? But um, this is called um, the, the Great Migration, uh, not the Great Migration, the Great American. And what I thought was interesting about it was we're talking about we're just looking at Californians leaving um, into the rest of the of the country. And you know, as I saw these dots go uh, from California out into the into the nation. Um, I started noticing that they were not going to the coastal areas that I thought were really cool before I was brought here um, at 15 years old from Mexico City. And um, I started wondering, you know, through the research that we did with Joel, um, how is that affecting where I live? So the Inland Empire is really the last, uh, the last stop for many people before they leave to other places. And what we have seen is a big consumer shift that has affected our communities. So um, with uh, millennials being 30 and moving into, by big numbers, into Riverside County, um, we see that they are uh, really interested in health and well-being. Open space after COVID particularly is becoming extremely um, attractive to the families that are young. And also they are uh, really looking to use remote work. We had a huge influx of remote workers uh, in Riverside and some of them higher. And uh, many of them are neighbors that came from Los Angeles and San Diego, and pretty much ate up the entire stock that was available for sale for residents that live in the Inland Empire. So I do want to make it clear that for many residents living in the Inland Empire, incomes have not gone up. So a lot of the movement that we see in uh, home ownership comes from uh, telecommuters and uh, higher income uh, migrants. Um, why are people moving? High cost housing is one of the biggest uh, um, factors. And then housing quality and neighborhood quality is one of the other two factors. And you are privileged if you can choose those factors and you can make those factors align and be part of your life. 
but people that are able to do it, these are the reasons uh, why they why do it. And if you look at the housing quality, which is something that Ryan was mentioning before, um, I had the opportunity to buy a house in Orange County. The reason I didn't buy it is because I would have eaten all of my equity trying to put that house back together. I chose to buy a brand new house in my entire, in a, in a city that was growing. And I actually found it because I would do research with Joel, so <laughs> really <laughs> It really helps you do research sometimes for <laughs> For investment reasons. So I also wanted to talk about the, the, the shift in demographics. And um, the, the one I want to focus on is that although there's a lot of shifting in the, the country, the inner county, county, not country, but the county, inner county uh, population, it shift was extremely interesting. You start seeing a, a big percentage of changes of people migrating into the suburbs or these like suburbs that we were talking about. And the county of Riverside is um, absolutely in line. So um, I'm not going to come this on for you because I know that if I did, you'd probably remember it, but I'm not good at singing as uh, some people might be like this. Um, so I, you may remember, you know, I told you my mom lived in Chino and around this same time, my sister, who uh, lived with my mom in Chino, this was around. This was this was a message that Orange County kids were getting about my sister, who wrote this uh, essay with me. Um, and who is no longer living here because as a millennial, she had to move to Denver, Colorado, because she couldn't afford to stay here. But we were talking about this when we were writing the essay. And, you know, there's this perception that the Inland Empire had this, like, white criminal good looking men that were trying to come to Orange County and take back the good looking girls. And it was just a really tense dynamic between the two regions. But when you when you look at the at the reality, is that a lot of young people are leaving regardless of their of their race. Um, we mentioned that Irvine you know is a telecommuting community and, and it's uh, growing very fast that community during the fast, but there's still a lot of work, working people that have to service Irvine that have to go in and out of the city. We cannot afford to live. The, the average hourly uh, rate uh, for payment in Irvine is about $21 an hour, which, you know, roughly, if you're a single person, just everything the same, it's about $3,000 state home. The average rent in Irvine is $3,074. So even if you're making $21 an hour, which is above the minimum wage by about $6 here in California, you still cannot afford to live in Irvine. Uh, if you make that out of the wage. And you are uh, renting 925 square feet, which, you know, for somebody that has a dog and a different lifestyle, they, they want a different option, it just doesn't cancel out. So Orange County's average rate of $2,432 just does not cancel out for a lot of people and, uh, and uh, immigrants. So um, I wanted to show you the impact of uh, this increase here in the Rio Empire. So Riverside grew by 10.4%. Just so that you can like, give a little bit more depth and perspective of that, um, every year since 2010, the, the Inland Empire received about 30,000 people. That's the size of the city. Um, we'll, we'll contextualize the Inland Empire a little bit better. San Bernardino grew at 7.2. And uh, what we saw was a decrease in, uh, in in demographics. In Orange County, it went down by, by almost 6%. Ventura lost 2.5, and Los Angeles lost 2. Riverside County is now the 10th most populous county in the nation. So it's not a small, it's not a small town. Uh, fastest growing in California. About 70% uh, of the IE are people of color. And 75% of African Americans and 80% of Hispanics live in suburbs and experts, very much like the ones in the IE. People like myself. So <clears throat> If you look at the Inland Empire, the land mass of the Inland Empire is about 27,000 square miles, and we are about 4.6 million. If you compare that to the state of South Carolina, it's a very similar land mass, like 32,000 square miles, and a population of 5 million. So in just two counties, you have the size of the state. Here are the, uh, here are the reasons why people are leaving. It's just a rational economic decision. In Orange, in Orange County, to buy a house uh, at $3,504 a month um, with a median at $985,000 price down, with a $195,000 down payment, doesn't compare to Riverside offering you a $2,000 payment at $565 price down with a one dollars and that's a 20% down. So people who are able to make the decision 
if that makes them. So I wanted to tell you, this is my neighbor, and I was just telling her that I was writing this essay, and I was telling her I was, you know, I'm an immigrant, and then she said, I'm an immigrant too, but I did not understand that she was, she's Caucasian, so I did, I was confused. And she is from Canada, and she moved to the United Empire, and she said, well, my parents, you know, my mom was Irish, and, um, and, and then she went to Canada, and then we ended up here in California, and married to somebody that had been born and raised in the Roman Empire, she was born and raised in Orange County. Uh, there was a debate at the moment where she lost her job uh, in, not she didn't lose her job, her job was not able to afford the uh, business rates and the, the rents that are happening in, in LA. So the small businesses and medium-sized businesses, instead of moving, what they did is they send their workers to work to work and they come to the Roman Empire. And this was her case and this was pre-COVID. So a lot of the decisions have been made uh, before COVID. COVID just accelerated a lot of this, but she has been my neighbor for a long, long time. And uh, this was a quote she said that to me. She said, um, her husband said, I'm just gonna tell you, we could afford to buy a house. It's the mainland empire, just suspend your OC mentality. He said, what's more important to you? Do you want to own something or do you want to be renting a total senior citizen? I certainly don't want to be a senior citizen and I'm very lucky. And I want everybody to be able to have that financial security. So for us in the Iman Empire, broadband could be a game changer when it comes to transportation. Um, this is a, a quick image of uh, commuting times. We do this, a lot of us, low and moderate families, we do this that race every day. And it's cool. And it's horrible for your health, for your family, for your community. Talk about being five minutes away from your kids. Try to be on the freeway, an hour away from them when, you, when they're going to have an emergency or when you have to get up to your teacher's conference. Just you're so detached from the community if you're doing this um, community. Um, so the, the, the community versus the, the remote work for some of us, I really appreciate uh, personal time. Uh, average is about 227 hours each year, which is equivalent to 28 days, and you can be dedicated to something. The, 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 the health cost and the, and the human cost for you to commute and, and go to the centric, uh, you know, located jobs um, really has a, a, an effect on your community. And I remember before COVID, I, I live in a, in a community that's very close to Orange County because I needed to do that horrible for me. And I, I'm telling you, it's horrible. Um, and I, I, I remember when I uh, was able to, I, I worked for the U.S. Census Bureau and one of their strategies to uh, continue to expand their, their reach is to have you work from home. So I was working from home pre pandemic and it was very notorious around the 2020 March mark. Uh, most of the people that live in the city called Eastvale, most of them are uh, commuters. 80% of the, of the city is a commuter city to Orange County. Well, when the pandemic came, most of us are in the upper ranges of, of income. Uh, everybody, everybody, it seemed like almost everybody was working. And all of a sudden I started noticing, I started knowing my neighbors. And, you know, Grandpa would show up and Usman would show up and like, we would come out and pick it up and some of us wearing pajamas and like, we've never seen each other this way. But it was very humbling and it was very cute. Um, so I just wanted to show you the amount of people that are doing these, these tracks every day. Uh, from San Bernardino to LA, you have 79,000 people going. Uh, from rivers, in, between Riverside and San Bernardino, 35,000. From Riverside into OC, 61,000. Imagine all those people in this freeway and just in stress and not getting paid a lot. And then gap is going up and you just want to be close to home. So um, I want to shift a little bit to tell you who is living there because it's important. And, and one of the things that I noticed when I worked for the Investments of Bureau, we were trying to educate a lot of legislators, a lot of uh, congressional uh, representatives. And to my big surprise, Many of them, like uh, Natalie was mentioning, they are not data driven in their decision making. A lot of the things that uh, I was mentioning about the census and how the census brings funding to them, and it was brand information. So even understanding their demographics and understanding who they're legislating for and who the public policy is made for is extremely hard to find people who are competent and who care about demographics. So they would know if they were educated about this. That, as Joe mentioned before, only 4% of the growth in the suburbs of the Inland Empire, or the in general, but the Inland Empire and the exo, uh, are of um, uh, white descent. But if you look at the uh, majority of people that are coming into these uh, high, more affordable areas, 
um, they have, they tend to be the low income and they tend to be people of color. So the share of Latinos in Riverside County, just so you get an idea, um, it went from 46% in 2010 to 51% in 2012. So if you think about Riverside, I'm just talking about um, you know the Hispanic population because it's easier for me to talk to you about it. I, we could go into so many different populations. So I'm going to focus on this. Um, in San Bernardino, the, the population went from 49% to 54%. And uh, the fastest, fastest growing population is the two plus six population in the Manet Valley. So it's very, very difficult work. And I'm just going to make a small plug for us Latinas. If you think about 4.6 million people, half of that being Latinos, half of that being Latinas, women, 25% of the, of the future of the Manet Valley is my hands. And in, in our success will be their success. So one, one in five residents are also immigrants, like myself. I came here from both right here when I was 15 years old from Mexico City, having a uh, part of this country ever since I came here. So I started my, my, my research and I thought, you know, Hispanics, they were everywhere. I could find Hispanics anywhere. But as I started asking about small businesses, I ran into Mike Sawe Saiwi, I can't say it. Um, he's the owner of Casa Masa in Norfolk, California. If you've never been to Norco, if you ever go to Norco, it's cowboy town. It's a very American looking town. But it's very interesting to see American cowboys and Mexican cowboys with their families going out with their horses at night and in the quiet of the night going with their horses uh, and saying hello to each other. They, they share a cultural value of open space, of uh, horse riding, with growing their own food. Something I have never been exposed to in New Mexico. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm from New York. So, this was what was really interesting about this uh, this interview is that Mike he opened up this, this casa masa for um, for the um, Middle Eastern Eastern population, but nobody was coming. He said, he said I wasn't getting much people from the Middle East, so most of my customers were like black, Mexican, and white. They are a big support, and without them, I would probably shut my doors. They supported me from the first day, and I really do uh, have a big appreciation. That would be, uh, one of the I just want to talk about the new suburbia and the, the new suburbia in Tulsa, uh, one of the places that really caught my attention. This is the type of um, image that they're selling to you. Interracial marriages with kids and a lot of fun things to do. They'll give you, Tulsa will give you $10,000 if you take your remote work to, to their uh, city and they will help you with home buyers, um, home buyer documents. So um, this is what we used to think about, but this is what I used to think about when I was an immigrant, about the American family and the suburbs. This is what I saw on TV. Um, but the millennials and the offsprings are really changing that reality. So uh, millennials are the most diverse. If you look at the two plus races growing very, very fast. And if you look at the post millennial, they are, uh, they are really extremely diverse. 23% of the US population is millennial. And 38% of that is the primary working uh, age population. Out of that, 27% is a minority Thailand population. And within their range, 43% of the primary uh, age minorities. So they are carrying a lot of weight, uh, these millennials, with uh, aging parents and young people. Um, we comprise uh, more than half of the populations, the, the minority millennials comprise more than half of the populations of 10 states, including Texas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, and New Jersey. Millennials accounted for more than 67% of the first time home buying purchasing power and uh, put in 37% of the applications to repurchase. Multi generational households have quadrupled since 1971. And in the suburbs of Denver, you see that the future is older and more racially and ethnic. And then you start thinking about community. You start thinking about gener intergenerational housing, multi-generational housing. Designs that we never thought would be a single family home, but there is a single family living in it. So the US is shrinking. And in a shrinking and aging economy, a young diverse workforce of a region uh, is one of the region's most precious assets, and that's what they want to has. It has some of the most diverse 
in some of the youngest populations that you can find in California. How much uh, is this important? Very important because according to the Federal Bureau, I'm sorry, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, states, U.S. states can gain a lot of money by closing the racial gap, uh, gap in the labor market. Um, investing in banking, in, in baking a bigger pie is what I'm inviting you to do, and to serve everyone. If California was able to close this gap, according to the Federal Reserve Bank, we would be making $460 billion here in California. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but it's basically investing in, in educational attainment, uh, closing the, the gap in earnings, um, and understanding that this gap, what these gaps mean. Uh, collectively, Latinos are underpaid $288 billion. Uh, that takes away from their purchasing power. Um, they could be, if there were, if there was parity, there could be an extra $660 billion annually. Latino businesses nationally. Latino businesses could generate an additional 2.3 trillion in total revenue each year, generate 735,000 new businesses that could support 6.6 .6 million new jobs. And Latinos' annual flow of net wealth from one generation to the next could be 380 billion or higher. Is that nationwide? Um, our, our geographical location of the Iman Empire is extremely important. We are in the center of, uh, of commerce between two of the largest commercial corridors in the world. That is the Asian corridor and the Mexico corridor. Mexico is the second largest uh, consumer of goods uh, and services. Between Canada and Mexico, they're always fighting that title. Um, the exports of goods uh, between these uh, regions uh, is unfair. The North American trade uh, in, in the world is just unfair. So we are in the, in the middle of that. The racial composition of the Inland Empire workforce is 48% Latinos and 37% white. And it's getting much more. But if you look at the composition of the workforce as minorities, they tend to be the larger portion. Um, we need to invest in intellectual capital. You can see the difference between the Bay Area's median household income and the college attainment rates. They go almost hand in hand. So in the, uh, the, in the Inland Empire, this is our reality now. But this is the reality we're working on. Uh, Inland Empire has uh, top universities, uh, including a UC system, a, 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 a state, uh, state capital San Bernardino. Uh, we have community colleges. We are just uh, a, a great group of uh, students who are trying to to um, to address this issue. And if you look at some of the uh, graduation rates, and if you look at some of the um, fields that we are graduating from, we are becoming very diverse in the type of uh, workforce that we are developing. So we want to attract businesses that can connect to the students because once they graduate, they usually leave um, the Inland Empire. So uh, the IE's Generation Alpha, that means anybody 2010 and present uh, that was born from 2020 to the present um, and their offspring are the fastest um, migrating population they will be by far the most right, uh, racially diverse, educated, exactly uh, demographic that we have ever seen. Um, so I um, I leave you with this. In my uh, research, I connected with this motorcycle imam who uh, comes from Iowa and stops in every mosque, uh, letting people know through Instagram that he's coming to California. And when he gets here, he will donate his bike uh, to the church to incentivize you to continue to be connected to each other and to continue to travel um, the, the country and, and get and get to see it the way that he's up. And I just thought that that was such a connection uh, to somebody that was so far away, but that uh, understood what I was going through uh, just in Iowa. And uh, so thank you for coming. Be a little quick because I know we want to shift to QA. Um, so I'm going to be very critical of Houston today, but not because I don't love it. I absolutely love this city. And unlike Joel said, I'm probably the one millennial that's never going to leave this city. I'm going to have to come other down. So, um, but I am going to be pretty, pretty critical of the city because, like Joel mentioned about the population shift. Um, um, because like Joel mentioned about the population shifts that we're seeing, it's, it's certainly something that we've been seeing in Houston over the past two years, but we started to see that gradual change about five years ago. And so when you look at the data coming out of Houston over the past 10 years, um, not much has changed politically. Our county has changed politically a bit, but it's 
really been a shift in policy priorities that we're seeing from our local officials. They, they've shifted from kind of pragmatic solutions to issues that make Houston and the region the success that it is to novel policies that they hope will continue to lure people, but we're starting to see that the outcomes aren't what they, what they hope they would be. Um, this past year, we lost, well, let's see, in, in December, the city released its annual financial report. So if you don't read those, which most people don't, they're very detailed reports that cities put out every year around December, and it details the, the financial state of the city, but it also looks at population and tax rates over the past decade and things like that. And so this past year, Houston lost about 15,000 people, and that's Houston proper. Um, and the year before that, we lost about 18,000 people. So the, it, it did decrease a bit, but we are, are still seeing that that loss every year. And the, the Harris County um, of 4.1 million people where Houston sits at the seat of is staying pretty stagnant, like Joel mentioned. But what we're seeing is just regions in these counties around Houston are booming, both in economic development and in population and in diversification. Um, and, I, and I point back to those policy, the policy shifts that we've seen because as we've seen the change in Houston from prioritizing things like crime solutions and education and, and addressing debt and taxation and just your everyday um, issues that you find in municipal government, the outskirts, the, the sugar lands, which is a city that's, you know, maybe 20 miles outside of Houston and the woodlands, which is a city that's about 45 minutes north of Houston and Pearland, another suburb that's about 20 minutes outside of Houston. They've started to take advantage of that. They've innovated and they've grown to start to lure these people there. Um, one thing that, that Joel and I learned when we were doing a project about a year and a half ago um, in the Woodlands, the corporation that runs the Woodlands was telling us that they had long known their community to be a bedroom community of people who left the Woodlands to go into the city of Houston and work and then come back to the, to the Woodlands at night. But what they're starting to see is that shift in everybody coming outside of the city to come into the woodlands and work and the traffic patterns have changed where they're coming into the city and their population moving during the day because not only are people not only do they have the amenities to more people but they also have corporate relocations now because of the things that we're seeing happening in our major cities um some of the issues that i mean and all of our panelists touched on them the issues that are driving people out are our homelessness, for one, I mean, Houston has claimed to decrease homelessness by 62%, but if you live there, it doesn't look like it has decreased by 62%, but they, they tout that number all the time. And then we, we have crime. They just did a presentation last week where they were talking about how violent crime was down 8%. And in that same conversation, one of the council members talked about how that weekend his car was stolen. And then they also slipped in that, well, violent crime might be down six uh, 8%. Kidnapping is up 63%, but they just don't put that in the violent crime category because they wanted to separate it out. And then we look at, you know, uh, we have massive local debt in the city of Houston, which obviously drives taxation and, and is driving people out. And we have, I don't know if you guys heard, but in November, we, we had a serious water issue where we it had a bottle water notice for 48 hours. And it was about 12 hours into that that they told people, I mean, I'll get to some of the numbers about that in, in, a, in a minute, but all of the issues that they should be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis they are not and they're pushing these off to deal with other issues you know our mayor um he often touts that we're going to have the largest urban solar farm in the country which is great but not when you have crime and traffic and expensive housing and you can't drink the water that's coming out of your pipes and everything like that and you have a school district that is the largest school district in the state of texas the seventh in the country and it is about to be taken over by the state because they cannot get passing rates for their students um, and so these are all the issues that we're dealing with, and it's no wonder that people are leaving the city, and I expect that if we continue down this path, if our county and our city don't start to correct course, which there's no indication of it yet that they will, we're going to continue to see these trends um, outside of the city. Um, but we're, when you look at these other places that I mentioned, like the Woodlands and Pearland and Sugarland, they're really doing everything they can to attract these people who are looking for kind of refuge from the city. It used to be just people who were coming from California, New York, and New Jersey, my home state, who were coming into the city of Houston. But now when you have these people leaving, we, you know, the Woodlands was always in a community for families. And now they started to see that they are having millennials, single millennials um, move into the Woodlands. So what did they do? They started creating new products for those single millennials. So they started increasing multifamily housing. They were predominantly single family home community. Now they're starting to build apartments. They have the largest, I think it, they said it's the largest, longest wooden bar in Northern America, I think is what they said, to try to attract more <laughs> They have, um, you know, they're start, they used to just have uh, cookie cutter 
for box restaurants, but now they're starting to get actual concept restaurants coming in, really trying to build the amenities up so that they can capture all these people who are looking to flee the city. And it, and it seems to be working for them pretty well. Um, another community, Bridgeland, uh, which is a community we enjoy toward as well, where it's a number one that for a long time they were just building single family homes but they started to realize they needed different product sets so one of the things that they saw was that when people got older and their kids started to move out they started to downsize and move out of Bridgeland but they wanted to keep these people in so they started building um, one-story homes much smaller in the community so that if their kids moved down and started a family in Bridgeland then they could just move down the street into one of these smaller homes and kind of keep them there rather than maybe having them move into an apartment back in the city or something like that they also created new concept, well, no, how new it is, but they, they started implementing a concept where if you want multi-generational or just multi-family dwellings, they have the backyards kind of all abut each other where you can take up your fences and you have like kind of a large compound for your families with four homes in it. So they really got creative and innovative, not like what we're seeing in our cities or our major cities, at least in the state of Texas. Um, you know, when we look at some of the outlying counties like Waller County, which is one that has gone unnoticed for a long time. It's just a rural county um, with a with a historically black college called Prairie View A&M, which was really the driver of the county. There was really not much else there. So people would go to that college, but then move into the city of Houston. But now we're seeing a lot of development out there. There are uh, a new Tesla facilities coming out there. They're building 2,000 to 2,800 um, home uh, developments out there. And at the same time, another two and a half million square foot uh, logistics hub is being built out there. And in Amarillo, which I just found last week, they're they're expecting 4,000 new jobs because they're getting the first rare, or not first, but the only rare earth mineral refinery um, in the country. And they're really investing in there to pull people out there. Now, Amarillo is not that close to any major cities, but they're they're doing what they can to still lure people out into their areas as well. Um, and, and you know, I, so I mentioned some of the policies that are going wrong in the city of Houston and, and Harris County. Some of the things that they're doing to not fix them are, you know, I mentioned crime being up and, and them claiming that this 8% decrease is success. But the solution that they had a couple of years ago to address crime was this novel policy, this novel concept of taking $42 million of federal relief aid that they got because of COVID, investing it in early childhood education and labeling it as crime reduction. Because they said that if you invest in early childhood education, on the back end, you will see that these kids will not commit crimes 18 years from now, which is likely true, but it's not addressing the problem as it's happening today. Um, at the same time, we're seeing, uh, again, local debt. Instead of paying down the local debt, we're just seeing them lobby on new bond projects to keep the funding coming in. We're, um, it, we had the back to the water issue that we had. So we had the oil water notice. And what came out of that was that there needed to be $1.1 billion of maintenance done in the city of Houston's water facilities in order to maintain the capacity as it is now. That, that's not including if people start moving back into the city. So when they did a little research, what came out of that was that the city had done such poor planning that they had to pay $1.1 billion, but they only had $47 million set aside over a three-year period to address this issue. So the deferred maintenance costs of just keeping up the infrastructure for the current population is, is wildly more than anything that they can afford. And so as you're crowding out the budget, you're not going to be able to address the issues that continue to pop up. Uh, one of the other things, I'll just tell this quick story about um, kind of the, the policies not matching the needs of the community. During the, the height of COVID, but also immediately after George Floyd, there was a big conversation about defunding the police. And in Houston, that we were no exception. And city council one day had a, we have a, a uh, Pretty diverse city council, and they decided to have a conversation on it. And it was the longest public safety committee meeting that the city of Houston has ever had. It ran about six to seven hours. And they had hundreds of people call in to testify. People weren't showing up in person because it was still at the height of COVID, but they were calling in to testify. And you had a lot of people calling in saying they wanted the city of Houston to defund the police. And we have just with this new iteration of our city council, we have four year elections. Um, and so with this new iteration, we have a predominantly black council. And so after a while, maybe an hour and a half, two hours of this, they started asking these callers what their zip codes were and trying to figure out where these people are calling from because they were sure that the people in the communities that they represent don't want that. And that wasn't, that's not the policy uh, direction that they would have take. And so when they started getting these, these zip codes, they were finding that they, the people calling were from the suburbs outside of Houston. Houston. They weren't, these were just activists who were calling, encouraging the city of Houston to embrace this policy. And then you had a split among council where you did have 
um, the black council members and our black mayor who opposed this policy because they felt that from their communities they weren't hearing that solution, they are that as a solution. But the other council members wanted to push it forward. Luckily, because of a an overwhelming number of council members who didn't want to do that, we didn't go with that. But Dallas, on the other hand, did. Um, and then the mayor, it, it turned into a whole issue, but city council ended up voting in favor of defunding the police. The mayor vetoed it, and then he came, came under fire for it. But he, he made the same argument that as a black mayor who represents a predominantly black constituency, they did not want that. And people refused to believe that. And so um, he's still fighting with this city council over a lot of things, but it stemmed from that. Um, Houston, one of the things that's interesting about Houston, and when I say Houston in this sense, I mean the Houston region, mostly Fort Bend County, like Joel was saying, is we have the largest population of Nigerians in the U.S. that are outside of Nigeria, obviously. Um, and so we're, they, this was originally in Houston, in a part of Houston called A-Leaf. They kind of just found this place and they started moving in and, and built communities. And now we're seeing them leave as well because they're not finding the opportunities that they once had. And, you know, I was talking to the folks in the Woodlands last week, and they're seeing the same thing with, we have long, long um, received a lot of migrants coming in from Mexico. Well, now they're seeing that migrants coming in from specifically Monterey, Mexico, aren't coming to Houston. They're coming to the Woodlands, and they're finding a, they're finding their place there and start to build communities there. And so it's not just people inside the city of Houston who are leaving. It is people who would otherwise come to the city of Houston are starting to move elsewhere, uh, or starting to move into the country and move elsewhere outside of the city. Um, and so all that to say, you know, when you look at, at cities today, I think that over the past 10 years, it seems that we've really shifted from a pragmatic policy solution to kind of pursuing these novel concepts. And, and it is the fault of a lot of our local officials, but I often say and in my chapter in the book, I mentioned this as well, that it's the fault of kind of the citizenry as well, because we don't have an incredibly engaged citizenry, citizenry as we should. And it's hard to blame people because people say we are busy and they have kids and they have to go to soccer practice and work and this and that and the other. But without elected officials hearing from people what people want, what people need, then we're going to get the policies that we're seeing. And even when they do hear from them, we're probably still going to get a lot of these policies. But it, it makes it hard for us to complain when we're not involved in the process. And so I always encourage people to get more involved in the process because I do think that that's a piece that's currently missing. I know it's missing in the city of Houston. Um, you know, we heard some stories about people coming together and, and building solutions, and I, and I want to see more of that. We have that every now and then in our region, but I think we need to see it more robust and more regular, and we can start to see some of these things reverse. But um, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen without that. So I'm going to leave that, and then we can switch up to questions. All right. Thank you.